All right, welcome in. I'm Aton Shander. More importantly, that's Alex Baker. Awesome. Of course, the man who is behind everything, all the success here. And it's not just handing out picks. It's not just making you money with the content that we provide each and every day here at Stochastic. It is more importantly, and this is what I love because I get to hang with the boss, meaning you <laughs> out there gets to hang with the boss. Learning how to win consistently at DFS is very difficult. So we're providing, we, meaning Alex, of course, providing the tools here. Hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribed, of course, across the board here at Stochastic. And Alex, I'm excited because we're all going to learn from you about something you've been working on, larger DFS tournaments, especially for the hand builder, where we're talking about some specific strategies that might just go unnoticed or simply overlooked. Yeah, Aton, what's up, man? It's really exciting uh, to be talking with you about this stuff. Like, and of course, our goal here, like, our goal is to help you win more money with with your DFS lineups. And like, uh, I've been in the lab trying to figure out the perfect way to do this because what I what I've realized going through all this stuff is that like the average person out there like is is hand building lineups, and like a lot of times we kind of lose sight of that. But um, I've been looking at our tools and figuring out, okay, this is the best way to use them to build your lineup and set yourself up for a great chance of success. One thing, and we're going to break down strategies that you've applied here in this a piece that's going to work with everything we're talking about here, Alex. But the one thing initially that really jumped out is how you're breaking down these larger pool tournaments into three different tiers and how easy it might be for either the novice or somebody who is still trying to build bankroll to overlook that there are some pretty sharp players building by hand in that one to 10 lineup range, and that it's not just a bunch of people loading up on a buck or a buck 50 lineups. Yeah, definitely. And like, uh, it's kind of what I've noticed in any sort of like competitive endeavor. Like, one of my, my favorite pastimes is I'll play ping pong. And like it's at this ping pong bar, and like everyone who goes there is like, I'm I'm the best ping pong player I ever played. Uh, or I, I always like crush my friends in ping pong, and then they like play versus the guys there, and they get like absolutely demolished <laughs> because like every, the the skill level is actually like pretty high, and that's like an exciting thing because it's like a challenge to be able to like outsmart all the people you're playing against uh, in these DFS tournaments. So like it's interesting like. I think the perception of, of you guys watching, maybe like you see a lot of the pros on, on this channel and on Twitter, and like it's easy to lose sight of the fact that these large field tournaments on, on DraftKings and, and FanDuel, like there is a, a lot of casual players. Uh, so it's like um, it's not as hard to get an edge as you might expect in these tournaments. And I think there are some really sharp players and like, uh that that are watching already but we can like get that edge a little bit higher and i found you can make some really awesome lineups hand building so i'm looking forward to to going through that yeah and the theme here is going to be joining the two which is the ability to control as much as you can building by hand while using the tools that you alex have provided here across the board so much like we talk about individual stacks on MLB shows, there's a general theme or so that we'll look at approaching. And we will also have a nice visual here that will give you kind of a real-time example of what Alex is breaking down as we have a real slate to kind of show you. But overall, and you mentioned here the strategy is to appeal to the hand builder and show the value of the tools. Is there something specific that you either saw was an issue that you were looking to fix, or is it just something, maybe the evolution of hand building that we can apply with the tools that you already have on Stochastic? Yeah, I think we got some great tools to, to leverage here. And it is more kind of seeing the big picture uh, through the trees, like in these tournaments and figure out what's like the the thing I like to think about is what is the path of least resistance to making a winning lineup? Like what's the easiest way to do that? Because I don't want to be spending all day like coming up with one lineup. I want to be able to make a bunch. And we boiled it down to like uh, a step-by-step -step process here. Well, let's go through that first yep. and then we'll get into the reasons why. But you, like each site has a maximum number of players from the same team, five on DraftKings, four on FanDuel as far as batters. So our advice is you just pick one of our top stacks of the day and you take the maximum number of players from that team to begin with 
then you pick a second stack and you stack up that team and if you picked like a, a popular stack for your first stack maybe you go a little bit more contrarian for your second stack and vice versa and then you pick the best pitchers you can get so i think if you follow those three steps you're gonna have a really awesome lineup and of course sometimes it's you can't fit the lineup together that's when the one-offs come into play but for the most part it's like getting those stacks right and then getting the right pitchers how much of it is is simply that order where maybe people are just applying it wrong to where they're going after pitchers first and trying to build that way as opposed to how you lay it out where you're basing it off your top stack your sub secondary stack and then applying what you have to top pitchers yeah i think that's a huge part because the app it it puts you on pitcher first yeah. and that's usually not the best way to build your line because the pitcher is like a very secondary decision to the stack so we start with the stack and like going through these tournaments, I found that out of uh, the group of people entering one to 10 lineups, only 32% of these lineups were stacked optimally. So I, I consider that as like having all the players except one stacked or on DraftKings, having five players from one team stacked and then uh, three other players from one offs. But uh, like this group of players that, that made up 96% of the user base, the one through 10 entries, like most of them were not stacking. And if you actually look at the, the projection of each group, it's like extremely similar. Like the, the max entry players aren't having higher projections than the, the hand builders or the smaller entry players. And the ownership's not that much different. The, the big difference is the amount of stacking and correlation that these players are getting in their lineups. Is that, and it kind of correlates to where we're talking about specifics, the whys, if you will, behind the general strategy that you just broke down. But is that where the difference or separation can come if you're hand building in that one to 10 lineups where the rookie field, if you will, may not be stacking as much and you have the ability to apply the strategy you just laid out, even if it's only seven or eight hand built lineups? absolutely yeah i think that like what i learned through this is like most people know how to pick the right like the the good players and <laughs> yes. it's the correlation that is missing so like we really want everyone to to start off with the correlation because that's the key piece of the lineup once you get that correlation between your batters right you're setting yourself up for success then it's just a matter of kind of making the lineup fit with some good pitchers yeah, real quick though, Alex, before we get to picking picture pitchers, part of me and, and the necessity of applying what we have on site for tools to do that, there there's a distinguishable difference that you lay out in this piece that is worthy of us talking about. And and that again, it's something that I think maybe the average or at least the newer DFS player can overlook, which is, oh, well, a stack on FanDuel is a stack on DraftKings. A sub stack on FanDuel is a sub stack on DraftKings. Not everything is built equally, as you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that if you're making good lineups, the, the system on FanDuel or the lineup construction favors you better than DraftKings. Since like we've identified the big strategic mistake that people are making in these tournaments is a lack of stacking. The stack is more correlated on FanDuel because the runs and RBIs make up a higher percentage of the fantasy points. In addition, you only pick one pitcher instead of two. So like that stack is even more important on FanDuel. I think that uh, like all things equal, like that system on FanDuel like, favors stacking even more than DraftKings. And just to look at what we have <laughs> available for everybody on our top stacks tool, you have a bunch of different metrics on there, different ways in which you can approach right, of course, to the top stack percentage, which is telling you exactly that. But there are other metrics, pieces of data here that you can use to help gain advantage. And uh, just knowing from following you and doing shows with you, countering the field with ownership, gaining leverage is such a huge part, especially when it doesn't make sense out loud. But those are usually the big ones that you wind up winning. Yeah, that's true. But like, actually, like one of the things I found when I was doing the research for this is that the ownership is almost a reflection of how good the stack is. Interesting. So like, that's a very advanced strategy to like try to get leverage. Like when you look at these pro players, we came up with this new metric called stack score. 
And so uh, this is a little cheat sheet that, that we're working on behind the scenes that kind of beta testing right now, but like it ranks each uh, team stack as far as stack score. And uh, this metric better encapsulated what people are looking for to, to select their stacks as far as pros than anything else. And it's like a majority of the top stack percentage, a little bit of top value percentage, um, but it's really the combination of those two being high that, that makes a stack really awesome. And like my general advice is if you pick a, a stack from the top of this list, you're going to have a really solid start to your lineup. <clears throat> is that something that is, and this can kind of correlate, connect us, if you will, to talking about pitchers and applying what we've already laid out, Alex, as far as top stacks to now getting to the top pitchers. Are you noticing that similar explanation in ownership metric with pitchers as you see with top stacks? Definitely. Yeah. Pitcher ownership is even more like reflective of how good the plays are in general. So like uh, the most important thing isn't really how high owned your first stack is. Like in this particular slate that we have up here, <clears throat> Detroit is a very high owned stack because they're super cheap and they're playing in Wrigley Fields or sorry, in, uh, in Fenway Park a really good batter's park and uh 25 of the ownership is going to these tigers players it's not saying the tigers are a bad team to stack up but when you do stack them up then going to a team that's not popular like toronto today they're like pretty expensive and the ownership is low and that's that kind of balance that you want to establish in your lineup is if you're going like chalky or high owned with your first picks you want to balance that off with uh, preferably a stack that's a little bit lower on or also some pitchers that might be a little bit farther down the board. So just looking at it, so much of approaching your top pitcher, or maybe not all of it, right, or even half of it, but enough of it to bring up is where we have ranked a pitcher as far as on DraftKings or FanDuel for top two or top one, respectively. The other metric that you might look at could also simply be where you already have stacks, meaning it's not a consistent, constant thing across the board with the pitcher, Michaelis, whoever it may be, you Darvish. But in comparison to how you're building stacks that night, it may determine how much or how little you're getting to, even if it's only a 4 or 5% difference. Definitely. Yeah, Michaelis is super low on. We have them graded out as just a tiny bit below uh, average value. So... That could be one thing like, uh, okay, so you Darvish is 23% on. He has four points higher projection, but 23 times the ownership basically. So that's the kind of pivot you might consider making if your first two uh, picks or stacks are pretty popular. But if you if you have some stacks that aren't super popular, then going to the better play, you Darvish, getting those extra points in projection is usually the best play. Is there any other attack or, or area that you look at specifically following this strategy, of course, of building the primary and then the secondary sub stack, getting to the pitcher? Is there any other piece of strategy that is worth mentioning here when you're building your top pitchers or pitcher, depending on if it's at FanDuel? Definitely. So one of the, the key things here is like sometimes two stacks might not be easy to fit together and like that's where one offs come into play. Like today, uh, if you pick Boston and Toronto, like pretty low on stacks because the prices of guys are high. But if you get one of our top value plays in your lineup, like uh, today, Spencer Torkelson at 2.1K for the, the Tigers. I got to rep my hometown squad. Uh, <laughs> but like that's really when you want to go to the one off is like you get this extremely cheap guy that that's batting in a decent spot. And then like you wouldn't otherwise be able to make this line of work with Boston and Toronto. And for that reason, most people aren't going to come by in those teams. But if you can if you can make that work with a one off that that can really give you an additional edge. So ownership is is pushed to the back here, right? Because the assumption is that you've already separated your lineups via your stacks and your pitchers. With that said, does it really matter if you're attacking a guy like Mike Trout or you're attacking a guy like, you know, maybe the two or three hitter on one of the worst teams in baseball simply because they're going to get the expectation is at least they're going to get three, possibly four at bats in that game? 
Yeah, I think that Mike Trout's a great example of a, a guy that might not be a great one-off because yep. the reason you're going to end up on Mike Trout is you have all this excess salary because you picked all these cheap stacks. The problem is like you're going to end up in a situation where your lineup is dominated a lot. And I kind of like put it in poker terms for anyone who plays poker out there. It's like if if you if everyone is playing ace king you don't want to play ace queen that's going to put you at a huge disadvantage so like um the, the problem is like on days where your stacks go off like even a random outfielder is probably going to have a pretty good projection compared to mike trout and there's going to be a lot of lineups that have these outfielders from the same team as your stack and then you're putting yourself in a position where you need a random player even as good as mike trout not the highest likelihood they're going to put up like 20 points or more to outscore the guy that other people are having that correlation with. So that's not a situation that's really advantageous to you. All right. From stacks to pitchers <laughs> to one-offs, there is an element literally in this case that we have to bring up that you refer to here in this piece that comes up all the time on MLB shows. I know specifically with you because we've done this, but we cannot ignore weather. It is a factor in baseball that is so much more important, I know from a betting standpoint, than any of the indoor sports, even the NFL, right? So weather is an issue here. What do you do with weather? So with weather, um, okay, so anything about like the, the it being favorable for bats or pitchers is going to be factored into our tools already. So you don't want to account for that twice. Got so it. you just want to follow uh, – the the data we're providing as far as that but one of the biggest ways you can get an edge in dfs mlb is when there's potential rainout games and like i see this all the time is that a game is likely to be rained out there end up being a ton of dead lineups like uh in this particular example uh that i reference in this in this video like on our live before lock show eric and greg spent 45 minutes like talking about how you don't want to play this yankees game then it gets postponed but then 24 percent of lineups had players from this game and uh there were 13 percent that only had one player from this game and like that that just puts you in a horrible position where like if the rest of your lineup goes off you're going to be cursing yourself and uh we do provide projections on what we think the the risky game is going to get rained out are on our top stacks and and the projections or at least on this cheat sheet and the projections and that's this po po postponed risk column is blank unless there's a game that's likely to be postponed but when you fade the postponed games you can win huge money that night it's like a extremely large advantage that's amazing and and again everything that we have available on site we're constantly running promos 50 percent off your first month you mentioned here in the piece to the stochastic plus using that promo code in there, Stochastic MLB. It's all one word, the cap. So you you can take advantage of all of this. You can listen to what Alex is breaking down, apply it right away with all of the tools that are there for you that all of the guys that are on the videos are using. Right? So you reference Greg and Eric. I mean, everybody's using these for a reason here. Uh, this is a, a really thorough and, and comprehensive look, and uh, especially when you talk about it for the hand builder, in that low percentage group of you know maybe one to eleven lineups, is there anything that you want to look at to kind of encapsulate what we've talked about, Alex? To almost sum up in, in regards to the strategy, because the application of the tools and how you break it down is vital as far as just for hand builders and really gaining an edge in these larger pool tournaments. Definitely, yeah. I, I think that uh, like. DFS isn't rocket science, right? So, like, uh, like I think the biggest mistake people make is they try to outsmart people too much when, like, really, like, people are going to make mistakes, and you just don't want to make mistakes. You want to be the guy that plays really solid, like, really solid strategy, doesn't do anything crazy, and then you're going to profit when other people do something dumb. So, like, it's really, like, you don't have to overthink it. Like, you just got to... You got to use the data, make the right plays and not do anything dumb. And then you're going to win. <laughs> I love it. Keep it simple. Stupid. You could say that. <laughs> I can't. You've won enough to call everybody else in the world. That. Awesome stuff at awesome. DFS, of course, 
for Alex at Shander Show for me. We appreciate you hanging with us. Look, the goal here is to inform, is to educate so that you can use these tools each and every day and make money and not just have to wait to be told what to do. It's a sense of freedom, is it not, Alex, that we're providing out there? Definitely. And like one thing I want to mention, too, is like this is really for these easiest tournaments, the the ones that everyone wants to play with a 50 K for 15 bucks or hundred K. It's like, once the fields start getting tougher, like you go up to a $55 tournament, that's when you really want to start getting some of the more advanced strategy in there. And we have a lot of ways to do that, like using our tools and, and our shows, but like, uh, I think it is good to, to keep it kind of simple, just to make the right plays in, in these large field tournaments. And, just because these are, aren't the toughest to beat, you're going to put yourself in a position to succeed. Awesome. All right, you're all set out there. So thank Alex on Twitter. You can thank us here. Hit the thumbs up button and make sure you're subscribed. And we'll continue to educate you throughout the DFS and betting world here. So we appreciate you hanging with us. And thanks again.